Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to you all who've joined us from different time zones. This is uh, Rita Pani from the Center for Financial Studies at SPJ Institute of Management and Research, welcoming you to a very special session today that's entitled Value Me You Must, A Jedi Guide to Valuation, a masterclass with uh, the guru of valuation, Professor Ashwat Damodaran. Uh, the last uh, 12 to 15 months clearly have been a tumultuous journey for uh, uh, the global economy and the markets. And given where we stand today does highlight the fragility of the recovery that we've seen. Uh, are we really out of the crisis? Given the situation in India, it doesn't seem so. Uh, clearly the pandemic is raising its head again in various parts of the world. Um, there couldn't have been a more opportune time to get a view on the state of the markets approaches towards valuation and valuation methodologies from the thought leader CFS is hosting today. CFS, for those of you who are not as familiar, is a center for excellence in finance at SPJIMR. It provides a platform for the Institute to engage with industry, with academia, with policymakers and uh, uh, practicing managers like yourselves uh, in the area of finance, in achieving the mission of the Institute, which is to influence practice uh, and promote value-based growth. I have to highlight that today's session was initiated by the, the students of the Finance Committee at SPJMR. And on behalf of the Institute, we really have to thank Professor Damodaran for taking time out at 8 a.m. his time. Yes, it is 8 a.m. his time in California where he is. So really, thank you, Professor, for, for, for being here for us today. Uh, today's session is, um, is personally a very special session for me as well. One, because I get to represent my alma mater, SPJIMR, but I also have the honor and privilege of hosting my valuation professor. Uh, professor Damodaran really needs absolutely no introduction to the audience that we have here today. But uh, for the benefit of a number of students who've logged in, I will attempt to summarize. Uh, professor Damodaran holds the Kirshner Family Chair in Finance Education and is the Professor of Finance at the Stern School of Business, um, NYU. He taught at UC Berkeley prior to that. He completed his uh, BA in Accounting from Madras University, uh, MS in Management from IIM Bangalore, uh, and followed it up with an MBA and PhD from UCLA. Recognitions galore during his almost four decade uh, journey in teaching, some of which include the Giblin, Glucksman and Heyman Fellowships, a David Margolis Teaching Excellence Fellowship, and the Richard L. Rosenthal Award for Innovation in Investment Management and Corporate Finance. There is magic in his classroom, and I can, I can vouch for that, uh, for which he's been uh, voted uh, Professor of the Year five times during his stint at NYU. One of those years was probably my graduating batch as well, Professor. Uh, I can go on and on, but the idea is to hear it from the horse's mouth. Uh, someone who talks about valuation being as much storytelling as it is number crunching. My co-moderator uh, for the day is my fellow alum, Sanjeev Joshi. Sanjeev is uh, an accomplished investment professional as well with around 25 odd years of investing experience across markets. He researches the uh, healthcare sector at Brown Advisory, a Baltimore-based fund, uh, previously with UBS Asset Management as well. Uh, Sanjeev is a graduate of the Booth School of Business, University of Chicago, and an SPJN alum. Uh, thanks, Sanjeev. I know it's the middle of earnings season for you, and you just got off a call as well. It's 11 in a.m. your time there in D.C. where you are. Uh, so thank you, both of you. That makes it three of us in three different time zones, and there is a lockdown here in Mumbai. And we are going to make this happen today. So the way we've, uh, we've structured the session today is uh, we kick off with a masterclass with <clears throat> Professor Damodaran that all of you are really eagerly waiting for. Uh, Sanjeev will then follow it up with a conversation uh, on themes that we have tried, uh, tried to crowdsource in advance. We'll follow that up with uh, questions from the audience. So please do use the chat facility to, to send in your questions. And I'll try curate them. And we will squeeze in as many questions as we can at the end. With that said, I will now retire to the galleries the way I did in school uh, with this in my hand, which I have preserved for a long time and uh, listen to the guru of valuation. A very warm welcome to you, Professor Damodaran and over to you. Thank you, Rita. 
it's been a long time, but uh, I'm glad to see you again. And uh, let me pull up a uh, couple of things, make sure I'm set up for this, right? As Rita mentioned, I've been teaching a long time. So you should be able to see my slides, right? Okay, good. Okay. As Rita mentioned, I've been teaching a long time. I, I came to NYU in 1986. And when I came to NYU, I was given a class to teach. The class I was given to teach was security analysis. It's a class with a very long and hoary tradition. It's a class that was taught at uh, Columbia University by a guy called Ben Graham. You might have heard of him. And if you haven't heard of Ben, you've probably heard of his most famous student, Mr. Warren Buffett. So it's a class that's been taught forever. So 1986, I come in as an assistant professor. And the first thing I'm given is this class to teach. I take one look at the class and I said, I'm not teaching this class, most boring class ever. Because by 1986, we're showing its age. It was four weeks on stocks and three weeks on bonds and two weeks on futures and options and five weeks on institutional detail. Like what? There was an entire session on listing requirements of the New York Stock Exchange. Teaching was so easy in the days before Wikipedia. And all you needed to do was show up in class, list out the requirements, everybody took everything down and you left the classroom. So what did the head of my department said, I don't want to teach this class. Not a great attitude for an assistant professor who's just been hired, right? He should probably fired me on the spot. So he said, what would you like to teach instead? I said, I'd like to teach a valuation class. He said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff in valuation to actually fill a class. And you know what, he was absolutely right. In 1986, there wasn't enough stuff in valuation to fill a class. There were no books on valuation unless you wanted to go back to Ben Graham's security analysis. There were no classes on valuation anywhere in any business school. All of the alphabet soup of valuation certifications you have now, the ASA, NACPA, CFA, none of those existed. But I really, really wanted to teach this class. Now, a couple of ways I could have gone. One is to try to get official permission to teach a class. And one of the very the early things I learned in academia is if you wait for official permission, by the time it comes, you're too old to actually do whatever you ask permission to do, because you know what will happen, right? A committee would be formed and they'd meet and meet and meet and have baby committees, subcommittees, sub subcommittees, all reporting to each other. The other thing to do is not ask permission. So I said, okay, I'll teach a security analysis class. And I walked into that classroom and taught my first valuation class. They have no idea what I do in a room. Once I close the door, I can teach cooking for 15 weeks. If I give everybody A's, nobody's complaining. You know how long it took them to catch on? In 2008, I get a call from the Dean's office, 2008. He said, you know, and the person on the phone says, we, we hear you're teaching a valuation class. And I said, I've been doing it for 22 years. And they said, we don't see valuation listed anywhere in the course listings for NYU. I said, that's easy to explain. I've been hijacking all these other classes you've been giving me and teaching valuation instead. They said, that's not right. We should call it valuation. I said, I agree. So if you look at the NYU course schedule, valuation shows up for the very first time in 2008. This semester, I taught two sections of valuation, one to the MBAs and one to the undergraduates. And with my 58th and 59th semesters teaching valuation. And I'm going to say something about this class that's going to encapsulate how I think about valuation. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. Notice how I phrased it. I didn't know it when I walked into the class. I've learned in the course of teaching this class. Let me give you a few examples. About a year into teaching this class, I think it was October 19th of 1987. I'd finished teaching my class. At that time, NYU's business school was downtown, right next to the American Stock Exchange. I'd come back to my office. I look out of my window and everybody from the American Stock Exchange trading floor is out on the street. I said, what the heck happened? Maybe a fire alarm went off. You know what happened on October 19th of 1987? There's a one-day crash. On that day, the S&P 500 lost 22% of its value. Think about that, 22% gone in one day. 
two days later, I was back in front of my classroom. You know, the first question I was asked was, how do you explain a 22% drop in the market from a valuation perspective? There was no evading it. Even though I might not have had the answer, we had to talk about it. We had to reason our way through. I learned about flash crashes on that day and how to think through them. Then you get to the next decade and you have this wave of companies coming into public markets that nobody had seen before. What kinds of companies? Companies with very little revenues, big operating losses and huge dreams. The first wave of dot-com companies. I still remember the day in class when somebody asked me, can you really value amazon.com with a discounted cash flow model? And I said, yes, and I was trapped because then in class, we had to value Amazon with a discounted cash flow model. And this is a tiny online book retailer with big dreams. I still tell people everything I know about valuing young companies, I learned by valuing amazon.com in that classroom in 1997. In fact, it became the beginning of one of my books. The dark side of valuation came out of that question asked in class. Then you get to the next decade, you get to 2008. Then you get a market meltdown precipitated by banks behaving badly. And somebody in class asked, well, why would banks melting down bring the rest of the market down? And we had to talk about the interconnections between banks and other companies that make them this very special sector where if they go down, they take every, everybody down with them. And then you get to the last decade and you had the rise of companies whose most impressive numbers were not their revenues, their earnings, their cash flows, but the number of users and subscribers and members they brought to the table. Facebook's most impressive number is not its revenues. There are lots of companies with more revenues, not its margins, which are very high, but there are companies with higher margins. But the fact that they have two and a half billion users on the WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, platforms put together, two and a half billion. Netflix's most impressive number is 200 million subscribers. No entertainment company in history has had that many subscribers. And in 2017, somebody in my class asked, well, why are we valuing Netflix as a company? Why can't we value a Netflix subscriber? And I was stumped and I said, why not? And actually on the fly, we valued a Netflix subscriber in class. And the framework I developed was a framework I then used to value an Uber rider, an Amazon Prime member, a Spotify subscriber. I learned about how to value users, subscribers, and customers because we were surrounded by companies using those numbers to justify their pricing. This is a class that's as much about me learning as it is about me conveying what I'm learning. And every crisis becomes an opportunity for you to examine what you think you know and ask yourself, maybe I don't know what I do. March of 2020, when the world economy started going to crisis, I was in the midst of teaching evaluation class. And somebody in the class said, hey, should we stop the class? What's the point of valuing companies when the global economy is shut down? And I said, it's precisely during periods like this, when you're in a crisis that you've got to go back to basics, that you need a framework. And I picked the title for this session intentionally. I'm a Star Wars fan. And to me, my vision of a great valuation class is that it'll be taught by my favorite Star Wars character. Can you imagine a valuation class taught by Yoda? It's going to be a very, very soothing class, right? There's going to be no spikes in excitement. It's basically, the, 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 if there was a message from this class, it's chill. It's, the world is not going away. You can go back to basics. You have time on your side. And remember that. When we panic and we think we need to do something quickly, we take shortcuts. And that's when we get into trouble. I have, I, have zero, I, have, I have zero chance of getting through every slide. So don't worry if I go, don't get through every slide because what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is basically what I think is the most critical part of my evaluation class. I'm going to lay the foundations of what I think I've learned about value into a bunch of lessons. And there are going to be five lessons. Here's the first one. When you value a company, where do you go for your numbers? You go to the financial statements. So obvious, right? 
annual reports, 10Ks, 10Qs, filings. And who prepares those statements? It's accountants. And here's my first message. Accounting is not valuation. Accounting and finance are very different disciplines. They bring very different skills and very different emphases to the table. To understand how accountants think about the world, step back and look at the accountant's favorite financial statement. It's a balance sheet. And when you look at an accounting balance sheet, here's what you will see. The two things that drive accounting are embedded in the balance sheet. The first is accountants are historians. They record what you've done as a company. So when you look at what you see on the balance sheet, it's a recording of everything the company has done over its history. And second, accounting is rule driven. Almost everything that happens in a balance sheet reflects an accounting rule. Accountants are backward looking and rule driven. And even within balance sheets, you can see the inconsistencies that this creates, right? The way accountants record fixed assets is very different than the way they record financial assets, holdings in other companies. And they make up stuff as they go along. In fact, accountants like to talk a big game when it comes to intangible assets. But the biggest intangible asset on accounting balance sheet is perhaps the most dangerous accounting item ever created. It's called goodwill. Useless, pointless, it's a plug variable, but think of how much time and effort and money goes into estimating that number. Accountants are backward looking and rule driven. So in fact, one of the first things we do in class is I draw a contrast. I said, okay, let's leave accounting behind. Let's think about how we think about companies in finance. I have what I call a financial balance sheet. It looks like an accounting balance sheet in the sense it has the same headings, assets and liabilities, but that's where the resemblance stops. When I look at a company, I don't care whether their assets are fixed or financial or intangible or current, who cares? I'm gonna divide your value as a company into two groups of assets. Assets in place, investments you've already made as a company and growth assets. Assets in place are pretty easy to understand. If you're a manufacturing company, let, let's say Tata Motors, it's a reflection of the, ma the manufacturing plants, the production, the, act the investments you've already made as a company. You're saying, what are growth assets? This is the value that I'm giving to your company because of what I expect you to do in the future. How far in the future? As far as the eye can see and beyond. I'm giving you credit for investments you haven't even thought about it yet. I have to be forward looking in finance because the bulk of the value of some companies doesn't come from what they've already done, but it comes from what they expect to do in the future. It doesn't make them less as companies or more as companies, this is different. When you value a company like Airbnb, which I did in November of 2020, the bulk of Airbnb's value comes from what they will do in the future, not what they've already done. Finance is forward looking and it's principle driven. I tell people in my class that are like five principles in finance. Once you've got them, you've got this topic nailed because everything you do, you're going to go back to a first principle. So what I'm trying to say in a long winded way is while you might get your numbers from accounting statements, nothing should stop you from ripping them apart and doing it the way you think they should be done. I'll give you a very simple example. If you ask me to value a technology company, I think accounting statements for technology companies are absolute nonsense. And here's why. What's the biggest capex for a technology company? It's R&D, right? And what do accountants do with R&D? Screw it up big time. They treat it as an operating expense. Your biggest capital expenditure is being treated as an operating expense. You're saying, so what? Well, if you expense something, you can't show it as part of capital. So when you measure the return on equity or return on capital for a technology company, you're getting pure noise. So the first thing I need to do when I value a technology company is take their financials and redo them the way I think they should be done. Second stop, just because you have a D and a CF doesn't mean you have a DCF. 
I know people like to have done a DCF. 95% of the DCFs I see are absolute fiction. So let me lay out some principles on DCF. In fact, well, it's, it's quite funny because on my blog, I value companies. And I value companies because I'm interested in them. I, do, I, don't do exp, I don't do consulting. I don't do expert witness work. I value companies because I'm interested in them. And people often disagree with my valuations. And one of the things they accuse me of being is a theorist. See, you're an academic, you're a theorist. And I laugh because I know how little theory there is in my class. You want to see all the theory in my valuation class? It's one equation. It's a present value equation. It's as old as time. All you're saying in valuation, the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows in the asset. We spent 26 sessions and 15 weeks trying to nail those cash flows down and trying to come up with better ways of risk adjusting the discount rate. And embedded in that equation are three very simple propositions. And I go back to these anytime I get confused. Here's the first one. It's called the it proposition. It, it does not affect the cash flows and it does not affect the risk. It cannot affect value. What's it? You name it. Control, synergy, all those buzzwords you hear in valuation. If it does not affect the cash flows and it does not affect the risk, it cannot affect value. Every decade or so in business, you have this big buzzword working its way through. And consultants latch on, right? They say, if only you do this, everything's going to be magical. You know, the buzzword of the moment is? It's ESG. One of the most overhyped, oversold concepts in the history of business. And what's the underlying message? If you're a good company, you will become more valuable. And of course, you have you know, lines of consultants outside every company's door saying, we'll teach you how to be good. And then on the services measuring how good you are. What a racket. So last year, in fact, I wrote a paper in ESG from a valuation perspective. I said, okay, I'm open to the possibility that being good could make me valuable, but tell me how. Because if being good makes me so more valuable, it has to show up somewhere, right? Either it has to show up as higher cash flows. Maybe by being good, you can sell more. Maybe by being good, you have lower costs. Maybe by being good, you can do something that increases your cash flows. Or maybe by being good, you lower your discount rate. Maybe investors buy your shares because they want to buy shares in good companies. I said, stop this nonsense of selling this to every company as a magic potion. Let's get specific. Same thing with synergy. How many mergers get done on the basis of synergy that nobody measures? It's just a plug variable. Why are you paying this price? There's synergy. Well, if there is synergy, let's talk about where there is synergy. It's in the cash flows and the risk. Use the it proposition. It's a very, very, very good way of breaking through this, these distractions and looking at whether there's an actual value behind a word. The second proposition is what I call the der proposition. It's a very simple proposition. If you're sitting down to value a company and you start projecting cash flows and every cash flow you project is negative, stop right now. Your company is worth nothing. Somebody would have to pay you to buy this company rather than the other way around. Which brings me to my third and final proposition. A lot of people in my, every person in my class has to pick a company to value. And often they'll pick a company and they'll come to me in a panic in the second or third week, say, something's wrong, my cash flows are negative, should I change companies? I said, not so fast. Just because you have negative cash flows up front in the early years doesn't mean your company cannot be a valuable company. In fact, if you are trying to value a young growth company, your cash flows will be negative early on. You know why? Because you need to reinvest to produce that growth. Those cash flows being negative are a feature, not a bug. But these companies can still be valuable if at some point in time in the future, the cash flows turn positive, but they have to be disproportionately positive. I know in the last 40 years, we've increasingly turned valuation into financial modeling. You know what I mean by that? Most people, when they walk into my class, expect me to open up an Excel spreadsheet. I never 
ever open an Excel spreadsheet. In, in 40 years of evaluation, I think I've opened an Excel spreadsheet in my classroom maybe half a dozen times. Anybody can become an Excel ninja. Valuation is not a collection of numbers in a spreadsheet, it's answers to questions. Because when you sit down to value a company, there are four basic questions you need to ask and get answered to value the company. The first is, what are your cash flows from your existing investments? Remember we talked about investments you've already made? Let's start with that non-ambitious question. Let's get that nailed down. And the answer to that probably will be in your financial statements, your income, your cash flows. The second question I'm gonna ask is more nuanced. What is the value added or destroyed? Keyword there, added or destroyed by your growth ambitions. We treat growth as a good thing. Growth is not always good. You know, in 65% of companies globally last year, growth destroyed value. And here's why. The good side of growth is your earnings and revenues become larger over time. That's good, right? But to get that growth, what do you have to do? You have to reinvest in plant and equipment and R&D and acquisitions. If what you're throwing into the company to get the growth is greater than what you get in growth, growth can destroy value. And it's my job in valuation to address, are you the kind of company that creates value from growth or destroys value? The third question I'm gonna ask you is how risky it goes. Now notice what I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you what's your beta, what's your, I mean, I think sometimes we mistake models for end games. You can disagree on how we measure risk, but you cannot disagree with the basic proposition that if your cash flows are riskier, I need to demand a higher rate of return. And finally, to close up my valuation, I've got to ask you, when will your company become a mature company? You say, what's a mature company? A mature company is one that grows at a rate less than or equal to the economy. Why do I need to know? Because I have a math problem. A publicly traded company can go on and on and on forever, and I can't estimate cash flows forever. So what do I do at some point in time I stop, and I try to estimate what the value of my company will be when I stop. And the only way to do that in a discounted cash flow model is to assume that your cash flows grow at a constant rate forever after that point in time. What does that buy you? It buys you an infinite series in mathematics. 200 years ago, mathematicians solved for the value of that series. That's what becomes this magical terminal value in your valuation. Those are the four questions I'm trying to answer. And when I do a discounted cash flow valuation, those are the questions that I try to come up, that, that if I can answer, I value the company. One thing I've noticed with valuation models over time is they become bloated. 100 line items, 500 line items. I believe good valuations are parsimonious. Less is more. My job in valuation is to take what you tell me about a company and figure out how it shows up in minimalist inputs. In fact, most of my valuations revolve around five inputs. Five, that's it. The first is an input that reflects your growth story. I'm gonna capture that in my revenues. Revenues are the most honest way of capturing a growth story because to grow your revenues, you actually have to sell more units and charge a higher price. The profitability part of your story is gonna show up in what kind of margins I give you over time. I'm not gonna break down your expense items into 100, who cares? Whether it's SGNA or direct expenses, it's all in there. The efficiency part of your story is going to show up in what kind of reinvestment I assume about your company. To get that revenue growth, what are you reinvesting? Those three inputs give me my cash flows. I don't need 500 line items. I can get there with five. And to discount these, I need a risk-adjusted discount rate. I use betas and risk premiums and risk-free rates to get there, but there are means to an end. If you have a different model for adjusting for risk, I'm completely okay for it. And in doing all of this, I have to remember that when I do a discounted cash flow valuation, I'm valuing my company as a going concern. You're saying, what does that mean? In a discounted cash flow valuation, if you have bad years, your company has a bad year, but it comes back. Because you have to get to Nirvana. Nirvana for you is your terminal value. And in a discounted cash flow valuation, I always get you there. But there's a very real chance that your company will not make it. Imagine valuing a young startup. You know that two thirds of young startups don't make it. You can't capture that in a discounted cash flow valuation. 
You can't say, why can't I raise the discount rate? It doesn't work. So I capture that with a failure probability. You give me those inputs, I can essentially value pretty much any company that I'm into. When I look at a DCF, what I see are basically answers to those questions about what are your cash flows? Those are your base year numbers. What's the value of growth that shows up in your growth rate and your reinvestment? How risky are you? It shows up in your discard rate. And when will you be a mature company? It shows up in your terminal value. A couple of very simple suggestions on DCF. Obviously, we don't have time to kind of delve into the details. But when you do a discounted cash flow valuation, and this is increasingly an issue because we become globalized, you've got to make a choice on what currency you're going to use. You say, that's easy. If I have an Indian company, I have to value in rupees. Really? Why not? Why? If you're valuing Infosys, why can't you value Infosys in US dollars? In fact, why can't you value Reliance in euros? Currency is a measurement device and you have to make a choice. Will that choice matter? At the end, not, but along the way it will. And here's why. When you look at risk-free rates across currencies, they will be different. There is no such thing as a global risk-free rate. There is risk-free rates associated with currencies. The risk-free rate in Zambia and Kwacha is going to be much higher than the risk-free rate in Thai baht, and the risk-free rate in Thai baht might be much higher than the risk-free rate in US dollars, which might be much higher than the risk-free rate in euros. Now, part of you is saying if the risk-free rate is higher, my discount rate is going to be higher. You're absolutely right. Your discount rate in Indian rupees will always be higher than the discount rate for the exact same company in US dollars. It's got nothing to do with country risk. It's got everything to do with the fact that you've picked a different currency. But if you have a higher discount rate, your value should be lower, right? Not really, and here's why. If you choose to value a company in Indian rupees, your cash flows also have to be in Indian rupees. The same inflation that pushes up your discount rate will also push up your cash flows. I've taken multiple companies, and if you go to my website, you'll find them, and I value them in two currencies at the same point in time. I have an Infosys valuation. In rupees on the same day I value in US dollars, I get exactly the same value because what one hand gives you, the other hand will take away. What you cannot do is mix and match currencies. Second, one of the key inputs you need to value a company is an equity risk premium. And unfortunately, the way we teach people how to estimate this in classrooms is terrible. We ask them to look backwards. In fact, the way I was taught to estimate equity risk premiums in the US was to go look at this database called the Ibbotson database. Now it's run by Duff and Phelps, which looks at historical risk premiums, what stocks have earned over and above the T-bond rate or the T-bill rate over the last 60, 80, 90 years. Terrible way to do this, one, because it's backward looking. I want a risk premium for the future, not for the last 90 years. Second, the number itself is a moving target because depending on the time period I look at, what I use as a risk-free rate and how I compute my risk premium, I can come up with very different numbers. I've never liked historical risk premiums. And starting about maybe 30 years ago, I started estimating a forward-looking dynamic premium. And I stole from the bond market as my way of doing this. In the bond market, we compute yields to maturity for bonds by taking the bond price, getting the coupon and the face value and solving for that discount rate that makes the present value of those cash flows equal to the price of the bond. It's called the yield to maturity. I compute an analogous number for the stock market at the start of every month. So for the S&P 500, the start of 2021, I took the index on that day, projected our cash flows, solved for an IRR, basically the discount rate that makes the present value of the cash flows. And the number I got was 5.65%. You say, what do I do with that? I don't care what you hope you'd make or what you prayed you'd make. If you bought US stocks at the start of 2021, you can expect to make a 5.65% return. How does that give me an equity risk premium? You subtract out the T-bond rate, 0.93% that day. You get an equity risk premium of 4.72%. That's a number that I can track on a daily basis. In fact, I did in 2020, if you go to my website, I track this premium on a daily basis. And February and March 2020, when the market was melting down, that premium got as high as 8%. And finally, we talk about globalization. But the reality is globalization has started to affect everything we do in valuation. It's not just a word. 
investors are globalized and companies are globalized. This notion of US companies, Indian companies, Chinese companies, European companies is kind of outmoded. You have companies through the accident of history that happen to be incorporated in India, the US, but they're all competing in a global marketplace. What does that mean? You cannot attach an equity risk premium to a company based on where it's incorporated. You have to look at where it does business, which means to value Coca-Cola, I need to know not just the equity risk premium for the US, but the equity risk premium of every market that Coca-Cola operates in. What a nightmare. You know how many markets Coca-Cola operates in? Probably 75 different countries. But I have no choice. So at the start of every year on my website, and this is perhaps the most downloaded data set on my website, I estimate equity risk premiums by country. People think I do it for others, but I do it for myself. I need this table for the rest of the year to value companies. So if you look at Asia, you'll, you'll see my estimates of equity risk premium for pretty much every Asian country. If you're valuing a company, you need these proxies. And if you look at how I get these risk premiums, I, well, I don't have the time to provide the detail. Here's what I do. I start with the US equity risk premium, the S&P 500 premium as my mature market premium, 4.72%. And I use a measure of country risk default spreads, which I scale up for the fact that equities are riskier. And I do this on every single country. AAA rated countries like Germany and Australia have the same risk premium as the US. But triple B or double B or single B rated countries, you'll see the risk premiums start to go up to reflect the additional risk. And as I said, the reason I care is because I want to look at where you operate, not where you're incorporated. So on a valued Infosys, even though it's an Indian company, given the fact that it gets 62% of its revenues in the US, my equity risk premium needs to reflect that exposure. And finally, when you're doing a discounted cash flow valuation, you're telling a story, and I'm gonna be more, more explicit about what I mean by a story, but you have inputs. You have inputs about growth and inputs about margins and inputs about, you know, about risk. You need to make sure that those inputs are not at war with each other. Let me explain. You're trying to value a company and you give the company a high growth rate. You know what? I'm okay with that. And then you give the company low risk and no reinvestment. I'm not okay with it. I'm gonna push back and say, how can you have a company that's growing fast that's not reinvesting to produce the capacity for the growth and is so safe. Maybe you have a really good story to explain away the difference. I call this my valuation iron triangle. When I look at a DCF, this is the first thing I check. What's the growth rate? How much is being reinvested? How risky is this company? Because when those inputs start to fight each other, you got a valuation at war with itself. One final point about discounted cash flow valuations. People get so stuck on the D of a DCF that they never get to the CF. You know what I mean by that? In a typical discounted cash flow valuation, people spend so much time on estimating discount rates that they never stop and ask the question of what are the cash flows to this company? In fact, I'll estimate that in a typical discounted cash flow valuation, analysts spend 60 to 70% of the time estimating discount rates and maybe 30 to 40% of the time on cash flows. That's misguided. In a good valuation, the cost of capital shouldn't be taking up the heart of your attention. Here's why. At the start of every year, I compute the cost of capital for every publicly traded company in the world, 45,000 plus companies. In US dollar terms, of course, I could do it in any other currency, just add the differential inflation. You know, the median cost of capital for a global company was at the start of 2021, about 6%. Even if we adjust for the change in the risk free rate, maybe six and a half percent. Right now, a median company globally has a six and a half percent cost of capital. If you add an extra three or four percent for the extra inflation in rupees, a median Indian company should have a cost of capital of about 10 percent. If you're doing a discounted cash flow valuation of an Indian company and you're using an 18 percent cost of capital, I already have an issue with what you're doing because you're already off the chart. The range on cost of capital is not that large. In fact, 80% of US companies at the start of 2021 had cost of capital between four and six and a half percent. Think about that, 80% of companies in four and six and a half percent. 
So by the time you get to the valuation, there are lots of loose ends that you can have to deal with that can get you into trouble. So when you look at my Infosys valuation or my Airbnb valuation, you see a collection of numbers, but look past the numbers. As embedded in those numbers are the questions. What are my cash flows and existing assets? For Infosys, that's pretty substantial. They have existing investments that are pretty lucrative, high margins, high cash flows. What's the value for growth? With Infosys, the answer to that is not that much. Infosys today is not the Infosys of 1991. In 1991, the bulk of Infosys' value came from growth assets. Why? Because early in the process of becoming a successful company. Infosys is a middle-aged company now. When you think about corporate life cycles, that means the bulk of its value comes from what it's already done, not what you expect it to do in the future. And you see that reflected in this valuation. There is a growth rate, but it's a pretty modest growth rate. And what they're reinvesting is delivering that growth rate. But overall, what you see in my value is what I perceive as the end number. There's one final point I want to make before I stop for questions. When I start my, when I walk into my valuation class, my first day of class, there are probably, there are usually about 300 MBAs and th or 300 undergraduates in the class. So let's take the MBA class. I walk in, one of the first questions I ask, and this is a question that I want you to look inward to think about the answer because there is no right answer, it's about you. One of the first questions I ask is, if I asked you to describe yourself as a person, would you more naturally describe yourself as a storyteller or a number cruncher? What comes more easily to you, telling stories or numbers? Think about it. For each of us, we have a strong side and a weak side. If your strong side is working with numbers, guess what? You end up working more and more with numbers. You hang out with people who work with numbers. We live in a world of tribes where the number crunchers hang out together and the storytellers hang out together and never the twain shall meet. A good valuation is a bridge between stories and numbers. You know what I mean by a bridge? You show me a valuation of a company, not point to revenues in year 10, say, why are your revenues 10 billion in year 10? I need a story to justify those numbers. If all you have are numbers in a spreadsheet, you don't have a valuation, you have numbers in a spreadsheet. So one of the things we talk about in class is how you go from a story to a number. In fact, every valuation I present, I start with my story for the company. That's step one. Second stop, I stop and make sure the story I've told is not a fairy tale. Is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? Three P tests. Each one I'm raising the ante. Third step in the process, I take the story apart and I look at how it plays out in the numbers. That's what the revenue growth margins and reinvestment allow me to do, is take your story and play it out in the numbers. Fourth step. Those numbers give me a valuation. By the time I get to step four, my story is unfolded into numbers. The numbers give me a valuation. And this is step five. In step five, I show the numbers, the valuation to people who think least like me. Think about that. Don't show to other people who've gone through the same training, the same thought process you do. Show to people who don't think like you. And be open to what they say. Don't become defensive when they say, I don't like this, I don't understand this. Try to make your story better. I call this keeping the feedback loop open. Start with a story, check to make sure a story passes the three P task. Convert your story into numbers, the numbers into valuation, Get, open the feedback loop. I have an entire book on this process called Narrative and Numbers. If you have a chance and you, you find the book, you know, Take a look at it because it's a very unusual, it's, it's of all of my books, it is perhaps the book that talks about valuation most from the way I think about it. It's not about, you know, so you won't see a chapter in equity risk premiums when chapter on betas. You'd see essentially this process of going from story to value and why it's so critical that you stay disciplined in this process. In my evaluation class, I tell people, look, work on your weak side. If you're a numbers person, try to become a better storyteller. If you're a story person, try to get more comfortable with numbers. Because to me, the essence of being good at valuation 
is you're either a disciplined storyteller. In other words, you understand just enough numbers to bring in the discipline to storytelling or your imaginative number cruncher. In other words, you're willing to let your creative instincts go. You cannot do valuation as if it's an engineering problem. You get the inputs right, the output. That's not the way valuation works. So trust your imagination, be creative, and you'll see this play out. One final point, and I'll, I'll end for the questions. We use two words in investing interchangeably that we should not. You know what the two words are? Value and price. If you ask me to value something, I'm going to give you a number. If you ask me to price that very same thing, I might give you a very different number. And here's why. What drives value? Cash flows, growth, and risk. That's always been true. You might use a discounted cash flow model to get that. You know what drives price? Demand and supply, which might be affected by cash flows, growth, and risk, but it's also affected by mood and momentum. Let's stop using these words interchangeably. To value something, you might do a dis discounted cash flow valuation to price that exact same thing. You know what you're looking at? What other people are paying for similar things. Think of how you decide how much to pay for a house or an apartment. You don't do an intrinsic valuation. You look at what other people are paying for similar houses and apartments and you try to adjust. In the context of stocks, when you use a, a multiple and comparables, P ratio on these 15 companies, don't use the word value for what you've done. You've just priced the stock. Nothing wrong with that. But we need to use the word value and price differently. Which leaves me with, one with a final point. In the last decade, I've been asked questions like, is Bitcoin undervalued or overvalued? And my answer is a very simple one. If Bitcoin is a currency, it cannot be valued. Currencies can be priced. That's what an exchange rate is. It cannot be valued. In fact, Bitcoin is not an asset. The only things that can be valued are assets with cash flows. Bitcoin is a currency. Let's talk about how good it is as a currency. Maybe Bitcoin is like gold, a collectible. Let's talk about how good it is a collectible. But collectibles and currencies can only be priced. So knowing that line between things that can be priced and things that can be valued first takes away a huge amount of frustration. I'm not sitting there saying, how do I explain why GameStop went up from 30 to 400? It has nothing to do with value. It's a pricing game. The pricing game, it's mood and momentum and liquidity and revenge that's driving it. It's not my job to explain why the price does what it is, but I can try to explain what the value is. So draw a line between those two words because it's going to give you a way of making sense of a lot of what's happening in the world around you. So I've reached, I think, the, the end, end of my 45 minute stint. So I'm going to stop and open up for any questions you might have on anything we've talked about or anything we haven't talked about. Everything is fair game. Um, uh, Sanjeev, would you want to go on to the next segment and then just uh, have a conversation with Professor Damudaran and then we'll take all the questions from the audience after that. If sounds that's good. Okay, yeah? yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Professor Damodaran, for an excellent uh, talk. I think you enumerated a number of important issues uh, that we have to consider in valuing uh, companies. Now, in the beginning of the call, you you know you mentioned that uh, we have seen uh, different market regimes over the last several decades. Uh, you know, two thousand eight nine financial crisis, uh, and over the past decade, uh, we have seen strong outperformance by growth companies. Uh, and underperformance by value companies. A lot of notable value investors have struggled uh, with performance. Uh, what are the reasons for this? Uh, you know, if you have any thoughts on this, that'll be useful for us to know. Well, a lot of value investing in the 20th century was built on laziness. It's built on mean reversion, right? I mean, if you, th if you dig deep, that's basically what they assume, that if things go down, they go back up. And in the 20th century, the US was the most mean reverting economy of all time. So at the core of value investing success in the last century is that things always adjusted back to an average. And all you need to do is look at the last 20 years and you can see why that's not working. What's the essence of disruption? It basically ruins the status quo, which means if you're in the status quo, there's no reverting back to the average. 
and automobile company is not going to go back to the way it was in 1990, 1985, because Tesla has changed the rules of the game. What's I think unusual about the last 20 years is disruption is everywhere. It's not just one sector like it used to be in the 1980s or the 70s. It's every sector is being disrupted from financial services all the way to manufacturing companies. When you have disruption, mean reversion is the most dangerous delusion you can have. Things are not going to revert back. When Warren Buffett bought Kraft Heinz in 2015, my reaction is, what were you thinking? Why would anybody want cheese that stays liquid for the rest of eternity? Or 57 types of ketchup that nobody likes. But one of the problems with old time value investing is they were convinced that you know, given history, things would revert back. So part of the failure of value investing is the fact that it didn't see the underlying shift. in the. There's been a structural break in the economy and mean reversion stops working when there's a structural break. At some point though, you come back to steady state. So this too shall pass. It's not that value will come back, but I think steady state going forward will be more of a to and fro. You're not going to get the dominance you had in the 20th century for value stocks. You're not going to get the dominance you had for growth stocks in the last decade. You're going to get one year value does better, which is a healthier place to be, which means markets adjust, they over adjust, they correct, they adjust again. So I think what you're going to see going forward is a much more, I think, steady state of moving back and forth between the two. But I will shed no tears for old time value investing. It's, it was late, I, mean, the, I gave a talk in Omaha a few years ago, not to at the, at the Berkshire Hathaway meetings, but to a portfolio manager showing up at the meeting. And I described value investing with three R words. It's rigid, it's ritualistic, it's righteous. It's, that's basically a description of old time value investing, rigid rules that you're not supposed to break. No. A very ritualistic about the things you're supposed to do. You're supposed to read Ben Graham's security analysis. You're supposed to pay homage to Warren Buffett. You're supposed to do, the, so there's a whole list of things you're supposed to do. And finally, it's, it's very righteous. You know, anybody who's not a value investor is viewed as shallow, as not very smart. And anytime you become rigid, righteous, and ritualistic, you're asking for trouble. Well, that's interesting. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I guess you're saying that we have to make sure that the companies we are investing in, they are still relevant in the world and they are not serving products which are, uh, you know, not, which are, which, are, which, are, which are becoming less relevant. Or they're becoming less, you know, or they become less competitive. So basically, if you're an insurance company looking forward, I have to ask myself, as this business gets disrupted, what are insurance products going to look like? What are the margins going to look like? And just as a cautionary note, go back and look at brick and mortar retailers over the last 25 years in the US, right? There was no mean reversion there. It was just a long slide into doomsday. Why? Because Amazon changed the rules of the game. And as you get more, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll predict the same things happening in telecom. For a long time, telecom companies were quasi monopolies. They had pricing power. They were able to make money. The game's changing under them as technology changes. So as you invest in companies, you got to ask yourself, you know, the best, and that's why I think the corporate life cycle is such a good way to think about companies. A lot of these companies that value investors like are not just middle age; they're beyond middle age. They're old companies limping their way to death, right? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I wanted to request your feedback on uh, smaller size, fast growing companies as well. Uh, over the yeah. past two and a half years, three years, we have seen a uh, very enthusiastic reception in stock markets by spe especially technology sector companies, uh, which are, let's say, SaaS companies. Many of them are losing money uh, for the prior five to seven years, and they are forecast to lose money for the next several years, but they are growing their top line at a fast rate. Are there specific things one should keep in mind while valuing these companies? Yeah, I think you know, ultimately without making money, I don't care how much growth you have, you're gonna crash and burn. So one way to differentiate across these companies, the companies that are moving in the right direction. Because ultimately for these companies to make money, what has to happen, and if you cut it down to basics, their costs have to grow at a lower rate than their revenues. And that has to come from a plan. Either it has to come from economies of scale or it's got to come from a platform building that allows you to live off the fat for a while. 
So when you look at these companies, that's a question you're asking. As they scale up, are their costs scaling up equivalently? Because if they are, I don't care how much you're growing at. I don't like your company. That's why I think using those three levers is so useful. You've got a revenue growth lever, which allows you to bring in the growth part of the story, but you're also asking good questions about, hey, what are, what's, a, what's a pathway here to profitability? And what is profitability going to look like in this business? And how much are you reinvesting? In software companies, what you're reinvesting takes the form of R&D, the investment they have to make. It's all three have to be in place before you jump into these companies because the danger of jumping in just based on growth is you can be a company that grows and has a terrible business model, which means you deliver on growth, but you never deliver on profits and you reinvest a huge amount to get there. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, absolutely. And I guess there are times in stock market when there is excessive enthusiasm. We have seen number of companies you know, getting oversubscribed 40 to 50 times, stocks open up 50% to 100% up. So in a way, you're saying that it's time to be a little bit more cautious and thinking hard about what kind of profitability will these companies achieve? Yeah. People are not asking enough questions. That's the problem. We're at a point in the market where it's been so easy to make money for so long that people have become lazy. They assume, hey, everything goes up all the time. And this is not new, right? This is as old as markets. The longer a market boom lasts, the fewer questions people ask. And the fewer people quest questions people ask, the more likely it is that things are going to get pumped up without the follow-up questions that need to be asked. So I think it's, uh, it's not new. I'm not going to wring my hands and say how terrible it is. In fact, I, you know, I, I wrote a paper and said, what's so wrong? What's so bad about bubbles? Sounds like a terrible thing to say, but I think bubbles are parts of markets. They reflect this human capacity to, to dream the impossible, to try to, and, I, asked, and, I, and the, I entered the paper by saying, if you're so worried about bubbles, would you want to live in a world run by actuaries, a market run by actuaries? Think about it. If we lived in a world run by actuaries, we'd probably still be in caves. Because actuaries, every risk has to be nailed down. So they'd probably be just looking at fire saying, too dangerous, we can't get out of the cave. Thank God for visionaries who dream, who tell you these big stories. So to me, bubbles are a feature of markets. They're not a bug. You can't, and that's why when regulators and governments try to stop bubbles, they're missing the point. Because if you take away the things that lead to bubbles, you're also taking away the things that lead to innovation and change and the kinds of things that move us forward as human beings. Yeah, got it. That makes sense. Uh, you know, another interest, interesting thing uh, in your talk was the way you looked at you look at equity risk premium. You mentioned that for something like Coke, one has to look at end markets, different country exposure. Uh, now, one way uh, when we think about investing globally, we know that different countries have different cultures. For example, Japanese and Korean companies they do not pay high dividends, and uh, in US, it's a very capitalistic. Uh, sort of shareholder maximization tenant. Um, so uh, how do you, what's the best way to figure out the corporate governance part of it or, sh or alignment uh, or transparency of corporate governance? Uh, you know, factoring in these factors uh, when we think about equity risk premium. Well, let's go, let's cut to the heart of corporate governance. Why do you care? Because sometimes you want to change the management of a company. So the weaker corporate governance gets, the more you're stuck with the existing management. Is that going to hurt a company? It depends on how well the company is managed. A company that's already supremely well managed, you might say, I don't care. So a company like Alibaba, let's face it, you have zero corporate governance power in Alibaba. But you might say, look, no, Jack Ma and his team are pretty good. So I'm going to invest in Alibaba, even though I have no corporate governance power. The perils of poor corporate governance show up when you have a badly managed, badly run company because then you're kind of stuck with the management. This I think is part of the problem with family group companies in India. I mean, let's face it, so you know, just like every other set of companies, some family group companies are really well managed, some are averagely managed and some are badly managed. This is true across the world. But if you're in a market where corporate governance is good, the companies where you have bad management will get changed by activist investors, by shareholders pushing. 
But in a market where you don't have good corporate governance, you're kind of locked in. That family group is going to continue to run the company, which is one reason. There are some family group companies in India that traded three times earnings, four times earnings, five times earnings. And people look and say, oh my God, these companies are massively undervalued. No, they're not. What investors are discounting for is this company keeps getting run the way it is. It's going to keep destroying value. Then I'm going to build in that destruction into what I pay today. So I cut to the chase. I would say, look, rather than think of this as a cultural issue, think of it as a likelihood of change issue. And even in markets like the US where you describe shareholder power as large, remember in most technology companies that have gone public in the last 15 years, you know what's been characteristic of their share issuances? You have two classes of shares with different voting rights. And guess who controls the shares with the larger voting rights? It's a founder insiders in the company. There is zero chance that I can change Facebook. So in fact, I face as many hurdles in trying to change the management of Facebook as I do at an Indian family group company. For the moment, I own Facebook. Why? Because I feel it's a well-managed company. But I worry about what happens if at some point in time, I want change to come to Facebook because that's been cut off. So that's what corporate governance does. It makes it more difficult to create change and that becomes more of an issue when companies are badly managed and badly run. Got it, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I also wanted your thoughts on, uh, if we think of markets uh, as developed markets and emerging markets, we have seen uh, emerging markets significantly underperform uh, the developed markets, especially the US, for uh, seven to eight years, um, you know, is this a part of a cycle that we have seen in the past, or are there factors which justify the underperformance of emerging markets? I think first is you remember the U.S. market is really not a U.S. market; it's a global company. Because you look at the S and P 500, you basically have global companies that happen to be incorporated in the U.S. There is an advantage to having companies that are global companies because now you're you can go where the growth is. You're not stuck with the domestic economy anymore. One of the problems with some emerging markets is a huge percentage of the companies in that market are companies that get their revenues entirely from the domestic economy. I'll give you an example, the Turkish market. The Turkish market has very few multinationals because it's been too easy to make money in Turkey. So they become lazy and sloppy and they've gotten, con and when you have all of your companies be domestic companies, you are in a sense tied to that economy which means when that economy is doing well, you'll outperform the rest of the world, but you're also tied to your currency. By tying yourself so much to the domestic economy, you've tied yourself to the country and the currency, which means you can have extended periods where you underperform the rest of the world. So I don't think this is always going to lead to that market underperforming the US, but it's also going to mean that you're going to get stretches of time where you underperform de developed markets because of the way your domestic economy is evolving. Got it. All right. That makes sense. Uh, I also had a question uh, on uh, the role of monetary stimulus in uh, affecting valuation. We have seen um, unprecedented monetary stimulus over the past year, but even a little bit longer term, we have seen negative interest rates in uh, Japan and Europe for a while. Uh, now, this is something when we were back in school, we had not even uh, sort of thinking of this scenario. Uh, but the reality is this has been around for a long time. So, you know, what are the challenges in estimating cost of capital? Uh, or, no, you know, the, the no, risk-free cost of capital. It's right? just psychological, right? You're not used to those low risk-free rates. You feel uncomfortable. Get yeah. over it. Because here's the reality. There's this notion that central banks are the entities that have kept rates low. That's not true. You know what drives rates, right? Expected inflation and expected growth. If you have a deflationary economy with negative real growth, guess what? Your risk free rate could be negative. It's not a sign of health. It's a sign of sickness. What Europe and Japan are looking at are aging populations. I mean, Japan already, more than 50% of the population is retired over the age of 60. There's no way you're going to have real growth in an economy where people are aging and you know, less than half the population is working. So what you're seeing is negative risk-free rates in Europe and Japan are a sign that you have a deflationary economy with potentially negative real growth. 
remember what it would be said, what one hand gives you, the other hand takes away. So when you value a European company, you will get a really low discount rate in euros. The cost of capital in euros is probably closer to four and a half to 5%. But guess what? The same forces that keep risk free rates low will also keep your cash flows low. When my valuations, European companies haven't become magically more highly valued because the risk free rate has gone down. In fact, the reverse has happened. Those low risk free rates are hurting these companies from a value perspective because the forces that drive rates low are also affecting your cash flows. So my suggestion to people when it comes to interest rates is take the karmic pause, which is, it is what it is. Let it go. Go back to focusing on cash flows, growth, and risk, given where risk-free rates are today, rather than worrying about the risk-free rate is too low. What do I do about it? Because you're going to end up you know, spending days on this frustration and have nothing to show for it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. All right. Um... Maybe just a question also on, uh, does you, you mentioned that maybe it's not only the uh, central banks which are driving the interest rates lower, but the reality is that if a central bank says that we are gonna keep interest rates zero for the next two years, three years, uh, it just uh, encourages people to take more risk. So are there pockets in the market where you see excessive risk and how should, should one start thinking about can it become systemic risk at some point in time? So let me go back to the premise of the question. You said when central banks say they're going to keep rates low, it's the only rate the Fed sets. It's the Fed funds rate. It's been zero for the last 10 years, pretty much. Who cares? I mean, who borrows at the Fed funds rate? It's a short-term overnight bank borrowing and lending rate. The Fed doesn't set rates. Through the course of this year, T-bond rates have almost doubled in the US from 0.93% to 1.7%. Take a look at what the Fed has done. The Fed has actually kept saying, we're going to keep rates low, but the rate in the market has gone up. Why has it gone up? For a very simple reason. We're getting good news on real growth and people start to worry about it with the stimuli you're passing in trillions of dollars. When people think growth is going to pick up and inflation is going to go up, there's nothing, nothing a central bank can do to keep rates from going up. So if there are, are there people operating under the delusion that the central bank can keep rates low? Yes, and they're doing stupid things. And this includes CFOs of companies, it includes active investors who somehow operate under the delusion if Jerome Powell wants to keep rates low, rates will stay low. Let go of that. Jerome Powell is as much an observer of this market as you and I, rather than a controller of this market. But central banks do send those signals. I, now I you know personally, that, and I'm gonna say this about central bankers, the best central bankers should be seen and not heard. And across the world, I think central bankers are talking too much because the danger if you're a central bank is your power comes from the perception that you have power. You actually don't, but the percent, I call them like, it's like the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz had no power, but as long as he stashed, you know, was hidden and it looked like he had power, people thought he had power. The worst thing you can do is expose the fact that you don't have power because then you've lost all power as a central bank. Witness the Japanese central bank. Nobody cares what it thinks anymore because people have stopped caring. They realize, now I, I give the story of this um, rooster that in a, in a barnyard that every other farm animal looked up to because they thought the sun came up because the rooster crowed. Because every morning the rooster would crow, the sun would come up and say, look, and the rooster strutted around the farmyard saying, you know what, I am the king because I make the sun go up. Until one morning the rooster slept in, his alarm didn't go off, I guess, and the sun came up anyway. And the other farm animal said, the sun came up anyway, and he didn't even utter a sound. So you couldn't be doing this. Overnight, he went from being king of the farmyard to abandon animal. The central bank's power comes from getting ahead of the market. So if I were Jerome Powell now, I'd start sending signals like, hey, we want rates to go up. This way, when rates go up, you can act like you are the one who made. That's what good central banks do is they act like they're in charge, even though this is an autopilot being driven by bigger forces. And my worry is central bankers have started drinking their own Kool-Aid. 
They think they have power when in fact they don't. And that's a very dangerous place for a central bank to be. All right, that's, that's really, really uh, thought provoking. Uh, um, I have one last question. Uh, and after that, I'll pass it back to Rita for moderating the yeah. Q&A. And the question is, uh, you know, what investment advice will you have for uh, somebody who started, who's starting uh, to work right now, at the beginning of his career? I, I, a very simple advice. Don't try to get rich. Investing is about preserving and growing your wealth. It's not about getting rich. And starting with a mindset of investing is a way to get rich is a recipe for doing really stupid things. Because to get rich quickly, what do you have to do? You have to abandon all the first precepts of investing, right? You've got to concentrate rather than diversify. Terrible advice. When I hear a Mark Cuban say, put your money in three stocks, this is selection bias playing out. You know what's historically happened to most people who put their money in three stocks? They've crashed and burned. But if you want to get rich quickly, it's better to concentrate than to diversify. Chase momentum. If you want to get rich quickly, you want to chase momentum. You want to be in stocks like GameStop and Coinbase or Bitcoin. Investing is about growing. It's about preserving and growing wealth, which means that to get rich, you got to get rich some other way and use investing as a way of staying rich. But I think too many people start with the wrong viewpoint on investing, which is this is my way of getting rich quickly. I'm not going to get a job. I don't care about what my studies look like. If I buy Bitcoin and it doubles, I'm becoming richer. So start with the right mindset and you're going to be a better investor. Got it. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, Rita, you're ready to kick off the Q&A session from the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sanjeev. And that, that was a really engrossing session. Um, since we, we kind of closed with the question on Bitcoin, I'll pick one uh, specifically on Bitcoin, zeroing down on Bitcoin price versus value. It seems like uh, Bitcoin is a representation of value in the Bitcoin blockchain. As more wallets come uh, online and transact on the Bitcoin blockchain, there are more network effects and more fees accruing to nodes. Uh, it's a long question. Wait, wait, wait. It's Rita, but where are the fees accruing? Bitcoin doesn't collect them. Fees accrue to the people transacting. So Coinbase is a business because every time it transact, there's a transaction fee, there are cash flows and earnings. So I can value Coinbase. Bitcoin is a currency. I can transact in the currency. There can be a blockchain involved, but if there are fees, it doesn't go to Bitcoin holders, right? It goes to the people running the computers. It goes to, so there are intermediaries who might be businesses that you can value, but Bitcoin itself cannot be valued. Absolutely. I mean, that, there are no ifs, ands, and buts. It can be priced, which means you've got to make up your mind. Is it a currency or is it a collectible? If it's a currency, you know how we price currencies? A good currency is one that, is the, that you can use for transactions easily. That's the first requirement because it's a, measure, it's, a, it's a medium of exchange that holds its value. And if you think on those terms, you can say the Swiss franc is a better currency than the Indian rupee, and the Indian rupee is a better currency than the Venezuelan Bolivar. Fiat currencies have to pass the test as well. The question is, where does Bitcoin fall in this spectrum? Is it closer to the Venezuelan Bolivar? Is it closer to the, to the, uh, to, to the, to the Swiss franc? And here's the problem. 12 years after the creation of Bitcoin, the number of transactions done with Bitcoin remains almost nothing. You know what I mean by transactions, mm, people sure. buying houses, buying goods, buying services, because it's an extraordinarily inefficient currency. And here's why. If I use Bitcoin to buy something, how does the process work? Somebody has to make sure that I have the Bitcoin in my wallet and somebody has to make sure that that Bitcoin arrives to the person that I'm giving it to. And guess what happens? A thousand miners in Ukraine go to work on their computers to make sure that the cappuccino I paid for in Starbucks actually, is this is no way to check a transaction. You think, why does Bitcoin do it? Because it was born, I mean, I describe Bitcoin as you know, created by paranoids for paranoids. Because the Bitcoin world, you trust no one. You don't trust the central bank. You don't trust authority. So what? guess what? Everything has to be crowd-checked. That's, that's what a blockchain is. Essentially, every transaction has to be crowd-checked. It's insanely inefficient. I mean, let's separate blockchain from Bitcoin. Blockchain is a technology that doesn't require Bitcoin. 
I can have, create a blockchain in US dollars. I can create a blockchain in, in Indian rupees. I can create a blockchain in Ethereum. Blockchain is a process that you can use with any currency. Bitcoin is a tr currency built on blockchain. So the fact that you like blockchain has nothing to do with whether Bitcoin is a good currency or a bad currency. And right now, if you look at the evidence, there is nothing that shows it's a good currency. The alternative view I've heard is Bitcoin is like gold. It's millennial gold. Sure. Okay. That you hold on to Bitcoin because you don't trust paper currencies. You think the world is going to come apart at the seam. And remember I said it's just you know, created by paranoids, for parent. And there are quite a large segment of the world population that believes that nobody can be trusted anymore. That the whole thing is going to come crashing down any moment. Okay. But let's yeah. see. You know, let's see whether that holds up. Gold has a 5,000 year history of holding its value through crisis. Bitcoin's been around 12 years. Is it closer to gold or is it closer to Beanie Babies? About 20 years ago, these, uh, these toys called Beanie Babies acquired a lot of pricing. People put their money in it. They bought it and put it in their attics. And right now they're worth nothing. We don't know whether Bitcoin is more Beanie Baby or gold. Right now, Bitcoin is a terrible currency and it hasn't proved its worth as a collectible. My problem with Bitcoin is not what it's trying to sell, but it doesn't do it very well. Which is a long-winded way of saying, if you're paying 50,000 for Bitcoin, look inward. Right now, the only reason people give for buying Bitcoin is that other people are making a lot of money or have made a lot of, that's a terrible basis for investing. If the only thing you can point to is, hey, other people have made a lot of money on this, therefore I'm jumping in. It's a pure momentum play. There's nothing behind it. And right now there's far less to Bitcoin than its proponents make it out to be. Sure, thanks, thanks Prof for that. Uh, there are a couple of follow-up questions on, um, on, on things that you addressed on ESG in particular. And, and the reason I bring it up is there've been a couple of them. Uh, it's, it's gained popularity here in India. And uh, I believe in the last year itself, of the seven to eight ESG funds, five of them were actually launched last year. Uh, the question is, uh, you did talk about it being maybe a little bit of a hype. Uh, is it because it's ESG... Not, even, not a little bit, it's all hype. <laughs> not, not a little bit. So I'll be very good. It's all hype. There's nothing there. In sure. fact, that's why I've said it's the most over-hyped, oversold concept in history, because I look at the evidence that ESG people offer, and it's laughably bad. Mm -hmm. And I look at so, the ESG funds, and I take a look at them, and I, and I'm, I don't want to cut into your question, but I'll, I'll take a look at what's in the ESG fund. I took a look at the, uh, at the BlackRock ESG fund, and actually the Wall Street Journal did a comparison of their not traditional BlackRock fund versus the ESG fund, they're almost exactly equivalent. They're, if you look at the weightings, it's like three stocks are weighted differently. But guess what? BlackRock makes 15 basis points in the ESG fund and five basis points in the traditional fund. There's a reason why ESG is so popular. A lot of money, a lot of people are making money on it. And guess what? None of them are investors or companies. There are institutions offering ESG funds, there are consultants selling ESG services. There's too much money in this ecosystem for people to let go. So guess what? You're gonna hear a lot of selling and a lot of manufactured evidence. An amazing mm -hmm. amount of research in ESG comes from biased sources where people are paying to create research to justify whatever they're doing. And you sure. see that when you look at the papers. Right. Now the question here was, is it that the frameworks uh, are not robust enough and if ESG indeed is a subset of good and shouldn't be used as a proxy for good? No, the, the, it's not the framework. First is what is good? I mean, unlike profitability, where we can agree on profitability, what exactly is a good person? I'd wager if I went around a room and asking, asked 100 people, what does good look like to you? I'd get 100 different answers because it depends on your moral code, where you grew up, what religion you are, what culture you have. And you know where it shows up in ESG? It's actually a paper that Elroy Dimson at the London Business School did where he took five different services that measure ESG and he looked at the correlation of rankings of companies across the services and he saw cor the correlation is 0.3. In other words, it's very low correlation across rankings because people can't agree. 
You know what the most widely held stocks in ESG funds are, right? The technology companies. Like what? Like Facebook. I wager that there are many classrooms I could go into where Facebook is viewed as the most evil company on the face of the earth, right? Because if you think privacy is your ultimate factor in defining good or bad, Facebook is a terrible company. If you think climate change is the worst thing on the face of the earth, ExxonMobil is the worst company. If you can't even agree on what's good and what's bad, how the heck do we get to the next stage of asking the question of how does this pay off? The basis for ESG is fluffy. It's subjective. It's like saying, you know, I'm going to define goodness. And my worry with ESG is what's going to happen to ESG is what happened with corporate governance 20 years ago. Because you know what happened to corporate governance? Services came in with corporate governance scores. Companies saw what they were ranking and they started playing checkbox corporate governance. I have nine directors, six are inside. So in effect, they went through the checkboxes. Corporate governance itself hasn't improved over 20 years, but we now spend more money on these checkbox corporate governance measures than we did 20 years ago. Now, that's why my, the title for my paper and my post was, uh, with the ESG was, do you want to do good or do you want to sound good? Right now, ESG is all about sounding good and looking good and saying all the right things in your annual report. And that's not a good way to approach. Do we want companies? We all have the shared objective, right? We want companies to be good. We don't want them to create costs for society. We all agree on that. The question is, how do we get there? I'm not sure ESG is the way to get there. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. Uh, there are a couple of questions here on, on DCF and uh, student questions, which I promised I'd kind of take them. Uh, in the context of, of traditional manufacturing companies in emerging markets in particular, is DCF still relevant in these super uncertain times with G being at best a guess? And I read the other one as well, which is similar. Uh, when deciding whether to invest in or uh, whether evaluating or making investment decisions or valuing companies, do qualitative figures really matter now, given this VUCA world, where things are changing rapidly? Question. Yeah, let me take the first question. Probably came from an engineer. Let me tell you the truth. Every number in evaluation is a guess. Stop this nonsense about guesses. Basically, you say, remember statistics. Some things you estimate more precisely than others. The fact that you can't estimate things more precisely doesn't mean you can't estimate them. There's a distribution around your estimate. That's not going to go away. Where is, that, where is that uncertainty coming from? It's not coming from the fact that you're not doing your job. It's coming from the fact that there's underlying uncertainty about the future. So what are you going to do instead? Apply a multiple? You think that makes the uncertainty go away? Uncertainty is here to stay. You have two choices. You can act like it's not there and use a multiple and say, I didn't deal with it. Or you can face up to it and make your best estimate and try to value companies. So don't use uncertainty as this dividing line, but it's got nothing to do with whether you can do DCF. It's got to do with the fact that the value that you get might come with a distribution, but that's always going to be the case. So I think that, that using uncertainty as the shield is just a way of saying, I don't want to do DCF. I have a nice excuse. That's what VCs use as an excuse for not valuing startups. They price them instead. They say too much yeah. uncertainty. You put an exit multiple, you think the uncertainty has gone away? Not in the least. It's there, it's just hidden in that third number that you've used. Sure. Uh, this is an interesting one. If you are to build a model for a company that in an upcoming industry with no set comparable, say, outer space exploration, how do you go about understanding the business and benchmarking it? You're talking Virgin Galactic? You know, because basically, you first have to make a decision. What is this company built to do? I mean, let's take SpaceX and Virgin Galactic. Both are space companies, but very different business models, right? SpaceX is a model that delivers satellites to space. And basically it's going to build off the demand that you have for putting more satellites in space. Why? Because we all needed broadband for information. So SpaceX is more of a B2B company. It's selling a business service that people need because we're increasingly dependent on these satellites. Virgin Galactic is an entertainment company. 
It's built on the premise that people who want to fly to Mars, really wealthy people, and pay $400,000 or $500,000 for the privilege of a one-week trip to Mars. Now, already you can see that the potential market for Virgin Galactic is far smaller than the potential market for SpaceX. Why, how many people can afford to spend a half a million dollars on a one-week trip? So when you think about space companies, start to draw, draw the line about what kind of companies are these. If it's a company like, like a Virgin Galactic, its revenues are going to be relatively small in steady state, but its margins are going to be sky high because that's what luxury businesses tend to have. It's like Ferrari, right? You don't sell very much, but you charge high margins. So if you look at my three levers, the revenue growth is going to cap off at a much lower number for Virgin Galactic, but its margins are going to be much higher. SpaceX has much more potential revenues, but because it's selling to businesses, it has to accept lower margins because there will be other companies trying to deliver these satellites as well. And it's got to negotiate with pretty powerful buyers. Use those levers to think about different companies. Don't put them all into the same pile because they're very different companies. Sure. Thanks, Prof. I know my, being mindful of time, uh, this, this is a question uh, I definitely have to ask you. The last year I have seen a number of sectors struggle. Education clearly was one of them and they were uh, forced to go online. Uh, you've been offering online programs for the longest time. What has been your motivation? I'm a teacher. I like a big audience rather than a small one. Why would I teach to a class of 200 when I can teach to a class of 200,000? It's as simple as that, right? So big audiences are better than smaller audiences. So I, you know, why, why keep this material? There's nothing I teach that's so secretive, so proprietary that if I let it, let it out, I mean, that's part of the problem, right? There are some teachers who think what they teach, if the rest of the world could see it, they lose their value as teachers. Teaching is not about content. The content is already out there. We live in a world where if all you have is content, you're going to, you're going to be outsourced in no time at all. It's how you deliver that content. And that's, that's all I do as a teacher is I take content that by itself is not that unique or proprietary. And I hopefully deliver it in a way where people get what's in that content. So I've never had any qualms about sharing that. And it's one Absolutely. of the few things that, that you share and you actually get richer in the process, right? Most things when you share, you're giving up what you own. What do I give up by, by having more people watch the class? NYU might, but I, frankly, I don't care. I mean, they might have other incentives. And let's face it, that's a dance that I have to do with, with my publishing companies, with, my, with the universities I teach for in terms of, you know, and they, you know, but the reality is they make enough money off me that they, they cannot upset the apple cart here. So I use that to maximum negotiating power to kind of share with as many people as I can. That's that's great philosophy, Professor. Which is which is why I guess you are the guru of valuation. Uh, as as we uh, wrap up, uh, any advice for the students who've joined uh, uh, the session today? Not necessarily from an investment perspective, but as they start out their careers at a time which is not particularly easy in the middle of a pandemic. Take it one step at a time. I'm a great believer in incremental steps, which is, I know, I know many, many people when they come out of school have these big visions. I want to be the greatest. I want to be the best. You know how you get to be the greatest or the best? You take it one step at a time. You build up to it. I mean, it's, I give the example. I mean, that's uh, not that this is the greatest, but if, I look, if you look at my website, it has a lot of stuff on it. And people say, how did you put all this stuff on? I started in 1992 with probably two items on my website. Then I had a couple here, a couple there. It's amazing how these things build up over time. And the same thing is true of knowledge. You add things and you keep adding things to the base and over time you build up. And the second is don't take any of this stuff too seriously, including yourself. I mean, the worst thing that can, I, I, in investing in business, the quality that is, I think, least attractive and the one most likely to get you into trouble is arrogance. When you think you know more than the people around you and you treat them accordingly. Remember, you can learn from everybody around you. Now, I tell people I learned more about value Uber by talking to every Uber driver that I was in a car with 
than I would ever learn by talking to Uber management. Be amazed at the things that you can learn from people that will make you. And finally, you know, you know, when we talk about companies and classes, we talk about how you need to have a competitive edge, a barrier to entry. As an individual, you need to think about what your niche is going to be. What do you do that's unique or different that is special? And each of us has some capacity to bring together different things and create this package that makes us unique. And the reason for that is survival. If what you're doing is mechanical, and I tell people, keep, it, keep track of what you do every day. If most of what you do every day is mechanical, you open the same spreadsheet, you go to the same places, you enter the same numbers, you're in big danger. Because guess what? A machine can do your mechanical things far better than you can. So think about what you bring to the table and try to work on that niche and work on your weak side. Whatever your weak side is, work on the weak side. Just don't feed your strengths. Professor, your last two answers pretty much capture the essence of, of today's session, really. Uh, I won't dilute it by, by adding uh, any comments there, but thank you very much for a really stimulating, enriching, and insightful 90 minutes of learning today. Lots, lots to ponder over, lots to chew over. There are so many more questions that are there in the chat. It was just impossible to uh, kind of uh, go through all of them today. But uh, on behalf of SVJ and Institute of Management of Research, uh, CFS, thank you very much, Professor Damodaran, for making time for us today. It was indeed a privilege to host you here today. Thanks, Sanjeev, thank uh, for uh, co-moderating the session uh, and for the audience for logging in on a Friday evening. Uh, so until the next time that we meet at another CFS webinar, do stay safe. Good night and, and have a great weekend ahead. Professor, it's not night yet for you. So yeah. thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you, Reed and Sanjeev. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Enjoyed the session. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.